part of the Earglue Media family of podcast. You're listening to the Cantina Cast. Your home for thought-provoking Star Wars talk. Join Adler and Jonesy in breaking down the latest news, trailers, movies, and of course, your favorite characters from a galaxy far, far away. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Cantina Cast. My name is Albert Padilla, and this is episode 280, the Rise of Skywalker Vanity Fair preview breakdown extravaganza. Uh, Originally, we were going to do a show on prophecies and visions, but well, then Vanity Fair decided to drop a bombshell us today on us today uh, later. I guess it was in the morning that they did that. So um, we did get a little bit. We got wind of this last night, so we probably should have seen this come in and adapted, but we didn't get a chance to. Nonetheless, we're here. We're going to do it. It should be a lot of fun. And joining me tonight is our resident Star Wars fashion expert, Jonesy. Jonesy, welcome back to the show, sir. I appreciate it. I'm very excited to be here. I'm wearing a nice coif white shirt. <laughs> it's very fancy. Yeah, does it have anything on it? You know, I would like to tell you that, but I can't tell you that because Disney made me sign an NDA. Yeah, so. yeah I've heard about those. Uh, so I'm so sorry. I subscribe to the Mike Rondo School of Fashion where I have absolutely no pants on and you're lucky if I've got a shirt (laughs) on. So uh, that's me. But you do have a ball cap on. But I do have a ball cap, right? Yeah. Because I'm a gentleman. (laughs) The set is complete. You are a gentleman. That is very true. All right. Well, let's do this. Let's get to some news and uh, we will jump right into the main show and break down all that good stuff that was given to us today. So uh, we've got the Galaxy's Edge had this kind of employee staff VIP opening thing. Did you get a chance to look at some of the pictures there and some of the feedback people were posting on it? No, I haven't. Please enlighten yeah, me. Yeah, I, I really haven't dug into it too much. And honestly, it was because it's it. I don't think it's really, you know, a slice of life of what things are really truly going to be like. So I just, you know, take it with a grain of salt. But it looked crowded. I saw some videos that people posted of the lightsabers that they built. Uh, we got some pricing on them. Uh, there was a lot of feedback about, you know, what's the quality? Are they, is it good? That kind of thing. And all that was pretty positive, I guess, for what you're paying for it. The food reviews were all pretty positive as well. But again, these are the employees, right? And and right. the VIP. So I, I, yeah, a grain of salt, I guess, if you will. But uh, yeah, not not quite the experience we will get when we're there, right? <laughs> right. I saw somebody, somebody posted, posted a picture and I think they, they had to have photoshopped what I guess what this looked like, because it did not, it just looked like a massive amount of people uh, around the Millennium Falcon. There was like really nowhere to move. And I really doubt that's really an honest picture, but my guess is that's probably more indicative of what it's going to be like for us public folk once we decide to go. But anyways, it's opening uh, next Friday, right? I think it's the official release opening day. Um, This, I think it's, yeah, yeah, next week, yeah, next week. Yeah, yeah, so like that last week in May is when we'll get that opening. So we'll we'll obviously come back and talk about that. When yeah, my wife there. had mentioned the, the lightsaber to me, she said it was going to cost 200 bucks, which was a little more expensive, I think, than we had reported a while back. So it, this might be the, the the higher end version, but she was, she was told me no. I didn't even know what she was talking about. Hmm. She was like, she was talking to my daughter. She was just tell your daddy no. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, what are you talking about? So apparently I will definitely get one of these things because it'll just get me in trouble. <laughs> and, <laughs> hey, what's what's a little interest in life if you're not in trouble with the business from time right, to time? Right. The uh, other thing we've got going on here, Vader Immortal has been officially released. Uh, I've so There's some videos out there, and I really have not had a chance to, excuse me, look at those videos or dive into them too much, but I did get the interview that Star Wars, the Star Wars show ran today with uh, two of the producers, developers, creators, I don't forget what they are, and right. there was, uh, I guess the, the tidbits from that, if you hadn't had a chance to look at it, it looks like we're obviously going to get a, a lot more on Mustafar, um, than maybe we have in the past. And I would say, I say that if you're a casual Star Wars fan, you're probably going to get a lot more. If you follow the comics, you probably have more insight already going into this. And, uh, so we'll, they talked about maybe getting some tidbits on the origin of Mustafar, how it got to where it is today and some of the indigenous people that exist on Mustafar, which we saw, and that's definitely stuff we got from the Vader comics um, just right. more recently. And then the other thing was that they said it really ties into Secrets of the Empire, which was, I guess, their first incarnation of this type of storytelling. Um, you know, in that storyline, I think Vader was on a quest to look for artifacts, 
And they didn't really say how, but there is a story thread that's running between both of these. So they found a way to kind of connect those, which is kind of cool. I like to see that that continuity take place here. But overall, we didn't really talk, talk too much about this, but is this something that you're excited about doing? I don't have any VR equipment yeah, either for either. console or for PC. And so I'm not... Is this going to make you go buy it though? I don't know. It's got to be really good. And I heard a lot of mixed reaction from it, mm-hmm. from Celebration. Some people were over the moon about it, but then I heard other people who were on the complete opposite who actually had pretty high expectations going in. So I don't know where this is actually going to fall in that spectrum, probably somewhere in between, but quite honestly, these things for the home market haven't always worked out very well. Secrets of the empire was at, uh, I believe that was the one that was at the Disney parks so with the void where it was interactive. You could feel heat. You were picking up stormtrooper blasters or blasters in general and, and doing these things. And right. that's a very different experience than being in your living room pretending like you're in those environments and you don't, you don't have the, you don't have the fourth dimensional aspect of it, right? Where you're getting sprayed or you, you feel the heat and, and those types of things. And uh, so I have to, I'll have to be curious. I mean, Oculus is pretty good. This is all through Oculus, right? Yep. So, I, you know, there's some things behind it that could make it good, but based on what I'd heard, I was, it didn't get me amped up to try to go and want to buy something or get invested in it. And yeah, we'll have to just, we'll have to see what our friends over at Bad Gamers Anonymous feel about it. Cause I'm sure they'll, Find a way to get their hands on this thing soon. Yeah, I'd like to hear Jason and uh, Joe's thoughts on it as well. So, all right. Well, um, you know, hopefully we'll get more on that. I'll get a chance and watch the videos. And if it's worth coming back and talking about here, we can spoil it some more. But the other thing, uh, there was an Empire Magazine Q&A that they did with J.J. Abrams. We were joking about it before we came on the air that we weren't going to talk about it. And now here I am talking about it. But I'm not going to talk (laughs) about it because there's nothing to talk about. He actually didn't answer anything. There was a bunch of questions that were asked and he is the master of, of dodging those questions. And he did a tremendous and outstanding job of doing that. So we got absolutely nothing from that, that you probably don't already know, but nonetheless, that magazine is coming out, I think next month. Um, and they'll probably have a special cover much like it did with the other movies. So look for that. And then I guess finally in the news, we've got, uh, alphabet squadron is doing some kind of cool. I thought they're on, on social media. If you follow Delray books, they are Star Wars Delray, whichever that is. I, I didn't write down the uh, the account. I follow them, but I don't have the account number here or the account name. Anyways, they are releasing this week a character per day from Alphabet Squadron. So we've already got some information on Erica Quell. She's the X-Wing pilot. We know now the U-Wing pilot is Ky- Kairos, I guess is, is this person's name. And it says her, so it, it's female, although Kairos, she wears a helmet. Body language kind of looks female. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I can tell by the pose here. Um, she's got a helmet on, so we don't really get to see her face. And there's, you know, she's got a very mysterious kind of, uh, background. There's already rumors going around that maybe she's a famous character or somebody we already know that's just incognito for whatever reasons. So kind of cool. Uh, Will Lark is the A-wing pilot. Uh, he seems to be the youngest one of them all. And the other one was Nath, Nath Tencent, who is our Y-wing pilot. And it looks like he was formerly... I guess he was his uh, his squadron was shot down by the Empire side. Uh, so all of this. And so we've got two more coming. We'll be out tomorrow and then Friday and we'll have the full main cast of what's this book called again? Alphabet Squadron. Thank you. Alphabet Squadron. Yeah. By your buddy. Yeah. By your buddy. Yeah. I'm, I'm Alexander Freed. I'm really looking forward to this. And I think it's cool. Like I like that they do. They do this because they're giving us images. They did it with like uh, Phasma. Right. We got to see a Cardinal and uh, even before the book had come out or when the book came out, we got to see that. So it's just nice to put like a, you know, a face to a name, if you will. So what do you think of the tagline? Victory has a price. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I haven't really speculated too much on it. Um, I don't know if that's something if that's the tagline going into the book and setting the tone or if that's going to be like a pivotal moment or we're going to walk away after reading this book and saying victory has a price. Uh, it's, it is intriguing. I will say that. And it's, they're blasting that all over all of these little previews and even on the website itself. So it'd be interesting to see. I don't really have a, a, a theory unless you got some. No. When does this book come out? It, uh, soon. Very, yeah, pretty soon, very right? soon. I could look it up, but that would take too long. I don't know why I want to, I want to say like July or something, but yeah, it's, it's well, we're terrible Star Wars broadcasters lately. <laughs> 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 I'm, this was, uh. I'm more excited about getting, no, no offense. I'm getting, I really want to get into this, uh, Vanity Fair stuff, which 
Let's do that. Let's talk about yeah, let's do it. the Vanity Fair thing. All right. So for those of you who were living under a rock today in Star Wars Newsland, Vanity Fair released a cover story and a couple different things. So they did a main cover story. Then they also released kind of a high level summary of all the tidbits because the article is pretty long and there's a lot of, I'd say fluff really, but it, I mean, there's some good stuff in there. Nothing that's probably worth speculating on. It was more like behind the scenes type stuff and, and interviews and right. that sort of thing. And then on top of that, they do what they traditionally do. And they release these amazing, gorgeous pictures by Annie Leibovitz who went out and, you know, did the photo shoots for the rise of Skywalker. She also did the, uh, the ones for the last two movies as well. Uh, and even the prequels. Um, I've got some of those that I kept when, when those were released, but they, uh, they threw all this together, put a big website out there, and the internet was just on fire all day long. So what I thought we'd do is kind of break down some of the article highlights first. Then we can um, talk about just two videos that they released. Some of that's kind of, it's a lot of the information is redundant, although there were some kind of unique things in those videos themselves. And then we'll end on the photos that were released and maybe talk through some of the speculation uh, from those. So Let's right. start with a couple of things that we learned from the article. We know now that this officially takes place a year after the events of The Last Jedi. So we got the time jump that we were hoping for. Is that enough time for you or did you want more? I was hoping for a little bit longer than that. Mm. I'm fine with the year. I, I don't know why three years always feels really good because you have a, enough time for a lot of different things to, to happen. But yeah. I, I get why if they stick to a year, I, I kind of understand why you, you want enough time for growth some things in the article that were a little disconnected for me is that, you know, he was saying that Ray's training is basically complete yep. and for it to be basically complete after a year is a little surprising. And that, that, that feeds probably just some criticism some folks will have, but then again, she's, you know, a pretty special case. Yeah. I think that's how they're going to, is that enough time for off. you or were you hoping for something? It, uh, I think you were looking for a year, weren't you? Yeah. I was looking for at least a year and I, I don't, the, the, I guess it really was dependent upon the. I, my opinion was probably contingent upon the story, and I'll, and I'll still reserve that right. for the story and see how it plays out. But the thing about a year is you don't want to go too far because then the stuff that's you know in the movie before doesn't feel so relative, right? It feels like too much Fair. time's passed, and they may have gotten past it, and are they still harboring feelings and all that kind of thing? Um, but again, it's really dependent on the story. You know, the time that that elapses between four and five, I think, feels right. Um, even though it was probably a little bit longer, but I would say for this one, a year feels good. It feels like enough times passed that things are still fresh in everyone's mind, but at the same time, it, it's allowed for some of this growth to continue with Ray. I, I think they're going to write her off as saying, you know, she's unique and she was, you know, we saw the transition from part seven to part eight. And, you know, if you were to expand that out, I think it makes sense if you follow that path that she probably would be at her pinnacle here coming into episode nine, which is interesting to, to speculate about. I'll agree with that. And you're right. The further out you get, the more disjointed the story is. And sometimes that's what you need, but perhaps a year probably going to work well for us here. As long, again, it, it kind of goes back to how much of the resistance is truly left. Where are they going to piece together? Because first order is still presumably very, very large. They they have had setbacks, but they're not right. astronomical setbacks, right? Aside from losing your supreme leader and your flagship, but and Star Killer, as long as but. yeah. So I mean, clearly, as long as they've still they didn't go and rebuild the entire resistance after a year back to a full military uh, scale of what they had with the rebellion by Jedi, as long as it kind of stays a bit rooted in that type of reality, I think this will still work perfectly and fine. We got confirmation that Ray Pin Finn Pin. Ray, Finn, and Poe are all in the same place <laughs> again. The uh, We got nothing really on Dio, Claude, which <laughs> I keep talking about Claude. I don't, I mean. Did you see the picture, the Photoshop of Claude? Uh, it was, I saw the Blast Point guys. Did they throw one up of that? Yeah, they did. Yeah, I saw it. It was that. hilarious. It was pretty good. Yeah, it was superimposing him for the Vanity Fair. It's what everybody really wanted, right? Right, right. It was Claude on the cover. <laughs> Claude on the cover. Um, that variant's going to go through the roof. Naomi Aki's character, which we'll talk about here, Carrie Russell, Richard Grant, they all, we've got pictures and we got some things that we can talk about, but for the most part, really didn't release a whole lot of information here. There's some interesting stuff that Abrams said that I wanted to just kind of touch on. He says, um, when he's talking about the challenge of the movie, he says, it wasn't just to make one film that as a standalone experience would be thrilling and scary and emotional and funny, but one that if you were to watch all nine of the films, 
you'd feel like, well, of course that, right? So, and what I got from this is, you know, we've been talking about how he's been trying to tie all nine movies together. And we've talked about how just, you know, how huge of a challenge that probably is to do. But it sounds like there are going to be things in here that we're going to be literally pointing at and going, oh, that that's that's from that episode. That's from this episode. And it plays to this theory. And I don't know if we've talked about it on the show. Maybe it's just in my own head canon, but I'd like them to, to, to visit different areas, different planets from, from all nine movies. Maybe they go back to Naboo. Maybe they go back to Hoth. Maybe they go back to Tatooine or, you know, name on any one of the movies that they, they visited before. Jakku is probably in there as well. And maybe that's the way they kind of tie it. They're on some mission, some quest, some artifact finding thing that requires them to kind of jump around. But that's kind of what I pulled from that. And, and I may be just reading that too literal there, but I thought it was interesting nonetheless. I think that's what we're wanting to hear though, right? Yeah. I mean, those are the, that's what our expectations are largely because JJ is setting them, <laughs> but there is going to be this payoff, especially at the end and, and maybe throughout the movie, like you're saying, but especially at the end, or whatever happens or whatever the climactic moment is, is that it makes sense within the entire saga, not necessarily within this trilogy or even maybe what we pulled from Return of the Jedi, but it actually links all the way back to the Phantom Menace and to the origins of Anakin, if you will. Mm -hmm. Or even, I mean, with, with Palpatine, at least semi in play here, whatever that turns out to be, you know, all the way back to, you know, potentially his origins or something along those lines, right? That you can pull and really tie the whole thing about why this matters so much. So, yeah, I, you know, uh, we'll see how that how that goes. But looks looks promising. At least he's talking about it. Now, here's something, though, that I felt was I'm going to call this a red flag. Maybe it's a red flag. Maybe it's not. But I want to get your opinion on it. And this is Abrams again talking about uh, filming episode seven. He says, I felt beholden to Star Wars in a way that was interesting. I was doing what to my best of my ability. I felt Star Wars should be. I felt slightly more renegade. Now he's talking about episode nine. It felt slightly more like, you know, F it. I'm going to do the things that make that feel right because it does, not because it adheres to something. And so do you get, does that strike you in, in a weird way? Do you feel like he's just kind of abandoning maybe, and he's kind of saying it here, I guess, literally, you know, he was, he felt beholden. He felt like we we saw it as maybe him honoring, right, the movies in the past. But yet here he is, he's kind of taking a different stance, almost a 180 and saying, you know what? Kill the past. I'm not I'm putting words on this one. That's not what he's saying. But he he is kind of going his own <laughs> renegade route this way. So does that give you pause at all? I think I view this as someone who is now familiar with where they're at. And if you remember back to Force Awakens, you're right. It was very much this responsibility, this very heavy weight to deliver something to write and or to you know help create something that was going to capture everyone's imagination, capture the spirit of Star Wars. And I think the word beholden to it is very important here is that he really had to make it feel. He, he, he was constricted, for lack of a better word, to tell a somewhat familiar story in order to bring us back into the world. It, it still felt real and it still felt like something that we understood. As we've gone through Last Jedi and now into this one, he now has... He's got all that out of the way. Yeah. Now he has this ability to be, I think I'm viewing it as being more creative with it. Not necessarily completely throw things away, but just to say, you know what? I know what I'm doing. I know these characters. I know what they should be doing. I know who they are. So I can write and I can direct. I can create these environments that make a lot of sense thematically and, and from a narrative perspective, but also not limit myself to what I would have had to do back in, 2015 and before 2015, as we were doing Force Awakens, I don't have to establish all this anymore. Now I've got the freedom to take these characters in an interesting direction that that makes sense, but also are exciting from a storytelling perspective. And I think that's that's what I'm reading from this is that he's got creative liberties now that he might not have felt before because he had this weight and this responsibility he had to bear for the for the first movie. Yeah, no, it's a good point. And and to be fair. Uh, I, you know, I pulled this one line out of the context of the article. And if you go back and read it, he does touch on some of what you're saying as well. So I, I'm giving the benefit of the doubt and saying that's really what he's, he's talking about here. The, well, that's uh, the hope, right? Yeah, that's the hope anyways. Right? Please don't screw it yeah, up. Don't JJ. screw it up, JJ. We're all counting on you. Thank you. No pressure. The, uh, there's another, there's some, they go on about talking about the, the trilogy and how, you know, this is really the sins of the father. This is very similar to what we heard on the stage at Celebration when Kathleen Kennedy was kind of talking about it. They um, there is they make another or I guess another comment in this article that uh, this will allow for the rise of the reactionary neo-imperial first order, 
whose origins we will learn more about in Skywalker. So I think from a uh, from a movie perspective, we're going to get some background uh, on the actual rise of the First Order, although we got a lot of that in the Bloodlines, or not Bloodlines. Well, we got some in Bloodlines. Yeah, yeah, that was a lot of the beginning yeah. of it. Um, and then also from the... Um, resistance and yeah so so we've had it in the novels really i guess is what i'm saying in in, in some of the other media but we've never really had a lot yeah, phasma too yeah maybe. phasma true yeah not not had a whole lot of the movies but it looks like they're going to go explore this and my my guess is we're gonna they're gonna tie this back into pride maybe i mean if there's anybody that's gonna kind of give the narrative and, and give the background get up there and start you know having a soliloquy of, of sorts trying to talk about this stuff i, I would imagine it's going to be somebody like him who seems like he's an old Salty dog, been there from the beginning, kind of thing. But um, yeah, are you interested in, in the backstory of the first order at this point in the in the trilogy? Though, well, I think the question is why. It's interesting that they're doing it now, right? I think that's the question. Right. Like, why have they decided to do it now? And and I've not put. I, I have very loose thoughts about where where that is or why that is. But um, that would be my thing. I would I would imagine that if they're going to explore this, they're not doing it for the sake of the audience because we've been just fine not knowing. You know, if especially if we talk about the general Star Wars populace, most of them don't know. I don't know that they even care. But if they're going to go there, it just feels like there's probably some significance. It's got it probably has some weight. Uh, maybe it's a simple story thread. Maybe it's a larger piece here that we're not privy to. But my guess is they've got to be going back and trying to tie it. There, there has to be a reason why they would do this at this point. That's a good point. I, I hope there's a reason. I hope it just doesn't come across as filler. Yeah, because that would be that would be disappointing to to get that. Am I interested in a little bit of flair for it? I think they've teased enough in the other mediums. If they were able to bring some of that in in a meaningful way for the deeper fan, like we would, you know, the enthusiast like us, mm -hmm. then I think that would be an interesting, you know, nugget to to go and grab onto and for us to take from a fan perspective. But I hope it's not a rehashing of some of the stuff we have. So it's so in your face about it. And, and just with the expectation of bringing everybody else up to speed in a story that doesn't necessarily matter too much. But it, the way that they wrote this part of the article was very interesting. And, and, and they brought up like fascism a couple of different times yeah, to try to tie back to the original trilogy mm -hmm. in the rise of Vader, which I, I thought was just kind of an interesting storyline of what, what the point was yeah. <laughs> of, all, of all of that besides, you know, I need to write X number of words in an article. Yeah. And I should, I should apologize. I didn't mention. So Lev Grossman is a, is a gentleman from Vanity Fair who put all this together. So I just, I forgot to mention his and credit him, but he's the one that's, it's kind of writing this stuff. And this is where we're kind of picking and pulling from is that main article. So um, he's got an interesting piece in here as well. And I'm, I'm throwing this out there just because I have, I'm surprised no one's latched onto it and maybe they won't, but there, he makes mention of Luke having hit himself away in, you know, what we saw in part seven uh, so that, quote, his chosen one, Ray, uh, had to spend most of the Force Awakens searching for him. And it's it, there's no quotes around it. It's just interesting, that perspective. And maybe this is, again, this could just be Lev's perspective here. But uh, it's interesting that he did say that, that Ray was Luke's chosen one. And, and maybe she is. I don't know. Anything there? Or you think this is just him taking creative liberty with the word chosen one? Because we get very, we get very guardian, like, territorial with that. Don't we? Oh, we do. We're very protective of that because it means so much to us. Yeah. And it is rooted in our entire fandom for the most part, right? Especially since the since the prequels in particular. Mm -hmm. I I'm I'm inclined to think this is him writing the article rather than knowing something specific. But I think it is an interesting perspective on it though, that it's it's who uh, Luke is choosing when we could both argue he didn't really choose her. <laughs> Right? Yeah. So I don't know, maybe she has become his chosen one as this story is told. And I think the teaser might, you know, it might suggest some of that, right? With what we learned, yeah. Luke has accepted it. We saw it at the, la at the end of Last Jedi and with the teaser and then, you know, a thousand generations are in you now. And if that text is, if that uh, commentary, that narrative is real, then maybe this isn't that far off. And maybe, you know, Luke has adopted it. And then Luke and Yoda and uh, Yoda seems to believe that there's, that, that thread as well. So right. it, it might not be that, maybe I've talked myself into it, but maybe that thread is, is real, at least from that perspective, from that point of view. Yep. From a certain point of view, the uh, Anthony Daniels has a line in here. He mentions that there was a line in the script that he had a hard time saying, and it was common emblem. And <laughs> okay. 
the end. So, and here's the thing. It's like, it, the, I put this in there because I wondered, okay, so it got me thinking. So what would 3PO be talking about when he says a common emblem? Um, and I always, he is a spy master, apparently. True. According to some of the other <laughs> books and comics these days. You're right. Yeah. I don't, I don't know about that, but yeah, he's been <laughs> around a while and he's a source of knowledge. He's like a walking Wikipedia, if you will. Um, I don't know. I, you know, I think about like the old Republic symbols and I'm going to, I don't, I don't want to wax old Republic here, but you know, some of those symbols that we see were today for like the Imperials and the rebels, those were used long ago for, and they meant different things or slight variations of them. And I just wonder if maybe that's what the emblem they're talking about. The for the other thing that came to mind is I've always really liked Anakin's symbol that he uses in the pod race. And I'm not saying or drawing anything, but that was something that jumped in my head. And I thought that'd be kind of cool if they, somehow repurpose that symbol and maybe in, in the context of this conversation, he's just saying, Hey, I've seen that before, but it's just a common emblem. It could be something, it could mean anything, right? Perhaps, or it could be a secret word, who knows? <laughs> because, you know, he is a spy master. He is a spy master. Just saying it's canon. And on that note, Daniels <laughs> also says that 3PO does something in the movie that surprises everybody, but he won't say what. Now we've talked about this probably off the record because this has been out there in the spoilers realm for, man, probably the better part of two, three months now uh, right. in knowing what 3PO does. So because we don't really get into spoilers here and, and the stuff that we're covering is right official, it's been it's already out there. So not really considered a spoiler. So we'll probably reserve any com any further commentary on there. But just to tease it, is it something that you think people knowing what you know, do you think people are going to be surprised when this happens? I think maybe it's very out of character. I think what that aside, and this is just me thinking off the top of my head. Yeah. One of these moments of heroism for 3PO, which I don't think we really, I'm trying to think if we've really seen a moment of true heroism where he's actually done something. Well, when his head was on the other, when his head was on that, uh, the droid body and he was yeah. shooting the other droids. No, I'm kidding. That's, I'm like stretching. That's not true. Well, he was enjoying that pretty yeah. much. Die, <laughs> die, die, Jedi, yeah, whatever it was. Yeah, that was pretty, actually, that was kind of, I kind of like that part. But anyway, <laughs> the, uh, of all the things in that movie that are kind of a mess. Uh, but I, I think, yeah, it'd be nice to see 3PO do something heroic, you know, and something that is less self-preservation. True. And I, th I think that would be a diver, you know, very different aspect of his character. And of course it would mean a lot if it was for R2 or something like that. Right. right. And, and again, this is not me because I know anything. This is just me thinking out loud of, what would what would something different for 3PO be that would shock people and maybe mean something along the way? I think so. We have talked about this and this is this goes back. I want to say we we speculated about this maybe even before The Last Jedi. But we jokingly said C-3PO showing some level of authority. Right. Like really just being yeah. fed up and like, I'm done. I'm taking over and you guys are listening <laughs> to me. And that and that would seem out of character for him because he's just so submissive it would. and he placates the people left and right. Right. Um, I just, I, it, that would be different and uh, out of character. So maybe there's. What if they make 3PO like a captain or, or a commander, commander or something like that? Uh, maybe. How insane would that be? It'd be a mess. I would never follow that guy <laughs> <laughs> at all. That would be a little bit of a mess. Um, Here's one. Sources close to the movie say that the Skywalker, that Skywalker, uh, will at long last bring to a climax the millennial long conflict between the Jedi Order and its dark shadow, the Sith. What? Wow. Well, sources close to the movie, Albert. I don't know if you. Yeah, I didn't catch that. Part. Where are your sources, buddy? But I just. OK, wait a second. So this is that the, came out of nowhere. No. Right? Yeah, exactly. And that's that's it. So I again, I don't even know where to go with this or where to speculate or even start. But because of Sith. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, we don't have a Sith conflict right now. I thought that Unless was pretty it's Palpatine, apparent. Which would be the only the only. But have they been in conflict for the last 20 years? No, mm, maybe not. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's the rub, right? We, we really had a Sith conflict for about, I don't know, a day and a half, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I don't, yeah, this is a really curious statement. I don't, I, I like the statement. Don't get me wrong. And it, I mean, in the dark shadow type of comment, you could read a lot into that if you want. I think some of this is creative, uh, you know, creative writing, but it, it's a very interesting statement. and. 
again, I think this is probably necessary and I, we haven't got to it yet, but you know, Knights of Ren and how that fits into the story mm-hmm. is another aspect. Is that something else that's percolating along the way? But to call this a millennia long conflict seems a, it is a stretch. It has not been a millennia long conflict. And this is not Old Republic because we got to get at least two or maybe three references back to it in every episode. Yeah. Well, and, and but, that's the yeah, thing, I mean, right? I mean, what else, what else is there though? Albert? I don't know. I mean, honestly, like, so when we get to episode four, there or at least when we get to episode one, right. That we've been in this millennia of peace and prosperity. There haven't been Sith in years, thousands of years, right. Or a thousand years now. So we didn't have a conflict really there. We did have a conflict with during the clone wars, obviously, but you know, I, 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 I can only think it has something to do with Palpatine, right? It, beyond that, they're really bringing in some stuff that we are just not even thinking about. And I would, I, I'm going to need some time to, to kind of wrap my head around what that could even possibly be. So my guess yeah, is, I mean, and to be, I said a day and a half. I mean, to be fair. Well, in the grand scheme of things. Vader and Luke's conflict. Yeah. We're, you know, off and on for several years, of course, and Obi-Wan and all that, but you get my point though. No, it's not like this has been a front and center all out war. And we can get cute with, we can get cute with the words like conflict and skirmish all we want from a historical standpoint. Cause I know those things mean, <laughs> mean certain types of battles and all of that, yeah. but yeah, it, this seems, yeah, this seems a bit creative on the writing front to me, but again, we want resolution, right? And, and, and Palpatine is the purest form of that with whatever Kylo and Ray end up becoming. Right. There, um, we got some confirmation that Leia's in the movie and they've repurposed some previously cut footage from The Force Awakens, which is kind of cool. We've speculated even, you know, right after her death, how this would even work. And I think this was one of the parts of the article that did a, a better job of helping us understand how this is going to work. Yeah. They did a better job of explaining how they redid the lighting and how they, they basically replicated all of these environments. And they even gave us moments of Billy Lord right, with her. is going to have screen time with Carrie Fisher in these characters. And now it's going to be cobbled together. Of course, it's not necessarily real, but it was nice getting a, an idea of how that's going to fit together and about what we can expect. And, and some of the, again, the, the care that goes into crafting these scenes and some of the challenges and, and the eye opening kind of moment that JJ had of, cause it sounds like he was doubtful a big chunk of the time mm-hmm. to hear him with this pleasant surprise that, you know what? I think we can pull this off. I think we did pull this off. Yeah, I think he. That's no. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, he used he used the word the uh, an impossible solution to an impossible problem or something like that is what he. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I uh, I'm pretty excited about it, and it sounds like it's it's going to work. And we've got to uh, not to steal our thunder, but there's we only got really one shot of Leia. Uh, there's a image of John Williams composing, and in the background there is a TV screen, which you know we've seen this before. If you've ever seen any of the be- the behind the scenes stuff and how. Williams does a lot of this. He he conducts and they record while this footage is running, and uh, it looks like we got uh, we got that one shot of Leia back there. But n- nothing else was. Re- there were no other pictures or anything else that was released with Leia in any of the stuff today. So, but um, yeah, it looks like I guess it's that was one of the other news items is that they're actually recording now. <laughs> the, no. the soundtrack. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I did see that, but I think we covered the twenty five minute mark or whatever it was. But yeah, the soundtrack's happening. So. Uh, here's, here's Lev Grossman trolling fans. He says the only other member of the surviving (laughs) Skywalker bloodline that we know of is Leia's son and Luke, former Padawan, the fallen Jedi, Kylo Ren. So it was that we know of part of it. So sure. And he went back and of course further does it by bringing Ray into the Skywalker conversation. (laughs) Pretty front and center, both in the article and, and then in the video, I think in particular, he emphasized that pretty clearly. We have a according to leading internet fan theories. <laughs> right. Mike Zero. I love Mike Zero. I love the internet. I love the fan theories, but probably not the greatest source. No. <laughs> We're all over the place in case he didn't know. There's uh there's a line a quote in here from Kylo Kylo Ren, Adam Driver. <laughs> he says, uh, and then he had been forging this maybe bond with Ray, he being uh, Kylo Ren. And it kind of ends with the question in the air. Is he going to pursue that relationship? Or when the door of her ship goes up, does that also close the camaraderie that they maybe were forming? He should listen to the Cantina cast reaction shows to The Last Jedi. <laughs> yeah. 
to answer all these questions for him. Yeah. Yeah. We, Cause we kind of said that that's over with or it's done at least from Ray's yeah. perspective. Right. Uh, we, I think we had speculated that he was still probably trying to, you know, dial her, maybe he butt dials her on accident, whatever. But from her perspective, we kind of felt like this was, this is over and done with like, and, and, and we won't get into this because there's a quote that Daisy Ridley says that I didn't put in here where she drops an F bomb in the quote, but, uh, talking about Kylo Ren and you know, how just it, from her perspective, it's like, man, really dude, you screwed this all up. You had a perfect opportunity here and you screwed it all up. Can't believe you did that kind of thing. Yep. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, something they'll be hitting. I like the whole maybe bond thing. Yeah. And they <laughs> use that in a couple different parts in this article. They keep calling it a maybe bond. So I laughed every time too. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm weird people. I'm sorry. <laughs> there was a good piece in there. Kylo Ren is going to have to confront his past and his fears, whatever they are, or be destroyed by them. And on the surface, there's probably not much there. But, you know, if you're thinking about Ben Demption and what it means for Kylo Ren, whether he makes it out of this movie or not, that last part was curious that he would use or be destroyed by them. So I don't know. Could be reading too yeah, much. I mean, this it. points to his infatuation with killing the past and not learning from it. I mean, he probably learned some of this from Luke himself because Luke wasn't able to let go of some things and teach about failure and all of that. Right. Yeah. I think this is a, this is kind of an obvious one that in order for him to move forward and to have any opportunity to be looked at in a positive light, he's got to deal with whatever he's dealing with in his head because it, it, yeah, it doesn't end well for anybody. There's um, talking about Ray. Uh, well, we touched on this and this is about her Jedi training that she's almost complete. There is a, another piece in here that was interesting. He says a source close to the movie says that their force connection will turn out to run even deeper than we thought. Any uh, thoughts Sounds around that? Yeah, you could go in a ton of different directions. And so if we Google the internet fan theories that are most popular at this time, mm. we, can, we can see what this might be. I'm going to pose my own stupid ones. How about that? Or crazy ones. I won't call them stupid, but crazy ones, right? You know, it, what would be interesting is if you ended up finding out, and this is a lot of exposition to work through, but <laughs> if you just want to go off the wall speculation, it's been a rough week, folks. So I'm just going to kind of go out there on a limb. Go, John, you go. All right. <laughs> you know, what if we ended up finding out that Ben Solo really wasn't conceived from Han Solo, but more so from the force. And then like Ray ended up being a force baby too, you know, that, that type of thing where, and they have some sort of connection in that regard, hmm. you know, and you can kind of take a, a ton of different directions. And when we get to the prophecy, I have got some other ones for you, but the, you know, you could just take this in a lot of different directions. I think the one that everyone's going to gravitate to pretty quickly is going to be the familial bond Yeah, that there's some connection there. And we will touch this when we get to the Dooku audio book, but there is definitely something between siblings to where there is a certain connection between them to where they can sense and they have a bond that's difficult to explain otherwise. And it's just there. It's not so, even if you haven't seen each other in forever or you never really knew each other, it's just there. And I think anytime you deal with family, you, you instantly gravitate. And when you see a comment like this, you, you go that route. But it'd be interesting if that's really the, we, we kind of ship it into that spot rather than something really kind of off the wall and, and crazy. He's kind of teasing this more as an off the wall, crazy type of revelation. I just don't know if it will truly go that far off the deep end to where, I don't know, to where we, we get really confused about it or, or think that was really amazing or really yeah. completely shattered our world. Anyway, what do you think? No, yeah, I'm, I'm with you and I'm glad you brought up Jenza, who is Dooku's sister. Um, oh, spoiler. <laughs> Just punch it in that one. Well, uh, it's in like the first 20 minutes of the book. So. Okay, true. So, uh, yeah, anyways. But, uh, but yeah, no, it's a good point. I, and I think that's where I think everyone's head is going. At least for the most part, a lot of these theories are now, these are all, all this, all, everything that's old is new again, right? Because um, we've talked about this to death. But he drops something like right. this and makes your head go there immediately. So let's see what else. Uh, there's an interesting piece in here about, um, there's, he makes a comment about, you know, the, the differences between Kylo and Ray, where Kylo is rejecting his family, Ray is kind of craving it, wants it. Um, it talks about some other unsubstantiated theories, which we're not going to get into. But here's, and then we got Ridley on Ray. Um, she says, "I think it's quite a good visual representation of where she is now: confident, calm, less fearful. It's still sort of overwhelming, but in a different way, it feels right, like less inevitable, and more like there's focus to the journey." And this is her talking about Ray and how much she's changed. Like, you know, a lot of that anxiety is gone and, and, and she probably still feels the weight 
maybe even more, you could argue more weight on her shoulders, uh, given that she is the last remaining Jedi and she's trying to rebuild everything. And she's had, you know, she's been going through this past year, but at the same time, she's much more confident in who she is and her abilities and that kind of thing. So it's almost kind of a wash, but uh, it is going to be interesting to see if we can see that in her face and how that comes across and her character and whether or not we see that development in her in this particular in, in episode nine. Yeah, I really liked this quote. I, mean, I, I think it is a great representation of where the character is going to be at at this moment. And I was just I was really happy to hear it from from Daisy Ridley, because I think this is I think this is going to get people really excited for the character, even more so than what we already saw, because part of the context of this was also she was happy to see the character at the beginning of the teaser. And you, you already get this visual representation that she has taken this considerable step or leap forward. And she is this powerful individual that has a much more rooted sense of self. And she has a, she has a purpose now, something she's always searched for and never understood how she fit into anything. Now she has it, even though you, you still don't know exactly where you're going you at least have an idea of which way the compass is pointed. Yeah. And I think for, for a character like that, it's, it's always a, it's a satisfying moment when you finally have that resolution, even if you still have conflict yet to come. And we saw that with Luke in the, in the return of the Jedi, rather, pardon me, where when you, we first see him in Jabba's palace, he's just very confident and actually overconfident. Right. Right. But when we see him in battle, it's just this guy that, Wow, who who is this guy? Right, he found his. But form. then you still, yeah, you, and then you still see this, this, uh, you know, this inability to always comprehend everything as he confronts Vader and come in confronts the Emperor. And I think that's a great, I think that's a really fun parallel. And I'm glad that uh, Ray is at this point now, to where we can see what the true final conflict is for her before we ultimately resolve it all. I think the, the one of the cool things too about this quote is I almost read this as like Daisy talking about Daisy, right? There was almost some, like some meta type of uh, message here in, in Daisy being more comfortable with, you know, m taking the mantle of this entire Skywalker saga and, and running with it. She Maybe she's going to, maybe we'll see that come across in, in her uh, honesty as well. So I think that's a great point. I mean, to, like we talked about with JJ earlier, once you've done a character for a couple of movies and for, presumably the better part of four or six years, yeah. whatever it is it takes to make these things. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you, you know, the character inside and out, you have a vested interest in where the character is going. And I mean, Mark Hamill has this with Luke, right? Which made, you know, his experience with last Jedi all the more emotional, but it's great. I mean, when the, when the actors take the journey with the character, it shows. And I'm hopeful that it's going to definitely show in the Ray character. For the other characters like uh, Finn, Rose, I mean, th this is pretty light and I, I'm not, honestly, there's not a lot in, in, in for the other characters. So don't think I, I don't want to talk about it, but uh, you know, Finn, they said he was single and ready to mingle. We, we heard that. We heard yeah. Boyega <laughs> say that. Uh, we heard in this article, we read that Rose is likely going, is likely for Finn um, more than anybody else. Although Jana's there. We've got a picture of her and, and Jana or him and Jana together. Uh, we got some information that Poe is now pretty high up in the leadership of the resistance, which is probably a no brainer given that there were only like 20 people still in, a little bit in the resistance. short supply there. <laughs> yeah, right. that's a quick way to get a promotion. Just everybody dies. You got nobody left. But no, he's he we we know Leia was, you know, kind of getting him ready and grooming him, grooming yeah. him to, to go in that into that position. So I was a little disappointed with as much of the fluff that we had within the the article that really each of these was at most one pair, like one shorter paragraph mm -hmm. crammed in kind of at the end, or they were shared. Like even the Rose character, I mean, really what you, what you said is basically all that's in there. And she was a bit of an important pivotal character in last Jedi. So that I get the wanting to everybody gravitates towards the, you know, JJ Abrams is the director, but also as, uh, you know, Kylo and Ray as the primary uh, characters, but you know, let's not throw them in there at kind of the end. Let's, let's actually get a little meat on that bone too. Yeah. And, and help us get excited about where these other characters are at too, because there are other interesting storylines going on that presumably have some sort of resolution as well. And casually throwing in, well, maybe there's a love interest is a bit disappointing. Yeah. I, 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 my, my hope is that this is, you know, they're focusing on the main characters and this is just the first and that, you know, over time between now and December, we're going to get more information and, and really kind of come to understand that there's a lot more there for these characters. Cause I don't, I don't sure. want them to just fall, you know, into the background 
right? I, I, I wouldn't want that at all. And I don't think it's going to happen, but it just, it's for Rose, it's just really, I don't know, it's kind of worrisome because we don't see her, you know, Kelly Marie Tran disappeared for a while there. We got to see her at Celebration. She's in the trailer, I think. Was she in the trailer? No. No. And I haven't, no. she's not in any of these pictures. And so I'm just, you know, we know she's in the movie. We just don't know where yet. So maybe we're, we'll just keep an open mind about it and hope that they're. Yeah. I mean, hopefully pacing. we haven't seen her because there's some spoilerific right. type of thing yeah, attached point. to it. Good point. All right. Well, let's, uh, the, well, we're not going to talk. So one of the videos is kind of a behind the scenes stuff and there's really not much there that's not already covered. Although I may hark back to it here in just a little bit when we're talking about a particular scene between Kylo and Ray. But there was another interesting video that Lev Grossman did where he was kind of talking about everything that we know, everything we don't know, and everything that he can't talk about. And that's kind of how it broke out, which turned out to only be really one thing at the very end. But the shocker too yeah. was real, real enlightening. Right. The, uh, the everything that we know. So we've already talked about uh, some of these, but uh, the first, the, the uh, Knights of Ren are back. We've talked about them. There, we've got some pictures that we'll get into here in a little bit. Uh, we got the name of Carrie Russell's character, Zori Bliss, who yeah. is a scoundrel, is how she's labeled. But hold that thought, because I want to come back to that. Uh, we got a new planet called Pasana with the Aki Aki. We had seen the Aki Aki, I think, in the trailer. Maybe we didn't. Maybe that was a spoiler. I don't know. Uh, Richard E. Grant <laughs> is coming back as the character of Allegiant General Pride. Uh, they said he's not a good guy. We got the picture of some ore box. These are these horse looking things that we'll talk about too. And that Luke is back though. He didn't really get into any details about whether or not he'd be coming back as a former, as a force ghost or a resurrected or anything like that. And then he hit it. He hit it again. He said that this is going to be the climax of the battle between the Jedi and the Sith. So that's everything that he knows. Now, here's the more important or maybe the more interesting thing is the stuff that we don't know. And these are things that we've speculated about. We've questioned as well, but who the title refers to. And he does touch on this a little bit and we kind of skipped over it, but he does make mention that we don't know that the, whether the, you know, the rise of Skywalker refers to Luke Skywalker, Anakin Skywalker, Ray Skywalker, the Skywalker as a group of people. Now a new form of Jedi, that kind of thing. All those have been touted about and speculated about since we got the title. Um, we got, uh, we don't know that Skywalker, you know, or what mentioned that, sorry, Skywalker, whether or not she's, uh, it's Ray or somebody else. Uh, Palpatine mentioned that we don't have any answers yet as to whether or not he's coming back in nine and in, you know, full flesh, or is it the spirit of him or is it a ghost? We still don't know. And here's one that we've talked about too, but the Lando's daughter being Jana. And I think we may have right. talked about that offline. I don't think we've ever really brought it up on the show. Maybe we did, but what are your thoughts there on that? Well, Finn's not the only one mingling, I guess, right? <laughs> yeah. I think, um, I don't know. I'm fine with it. I don't really have an opinion, to be honest with you. She looks cool. Oh, she looks awesome. She kind of looks like Valkyrie of sorts, yeah, right? Yeah. Uh, the, the picture is the, you have her on the, the war back with an arrow, kind of looking cool. Yeah. I'm all right with that. I mean, I hope it's not one of these discovery type of stories, but, you know, just to have her in the mix, it would make sense. And again, another, you know, a different kind of a different vibe of a character to help break up what we know and get something a little different infused into the story. I think it's not a bad thing. And um, there are some other ones here that we won't get into in the interest of time, but I think the last two that I want to just touch on quickly is he threw a question out there about Chewbacca and whether or not he would get revenge on Kylo Ren. Do you see Chewbacca as being somebody <laughs> revengeful like that, even with Han's death? I don't think so. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, we don't want to sully Chewbacca and we, we saw him, we saw him lash out. We talked about this recently. We, we saw him lash out. We saw him have the raw emotion of it all. But I think, again, some of this is context. If he sees Kylo Ren up in his face, that's very different than if he sees Ben Solo. Right. You know, presumably the, the little kid Ben Solo that he knew when, you know, when he was a, when he was a kid and bounced on his lap. He, yeah, exactly. Yeah. This like the, the, the newspaper comic strip the meme that's gone around for a long time right. of, you know, of that, that connection rather than this one of hatred and of uh, pain and of, you know, just, you know, maybe, I mean, maybe a threats of revenge in his head of what he would do with him. But I think at the end of the day, it depends on which character shows up for Kylo Ren, but yeah, revenge and Chewbacca. I mean, Wookiees are emotional creatures. So I guess you, it's not a far stretch 
but I would still like to think there is some sort of emotional bond between them that would give him just a little bit of pause and still show us that heart that Chewbacca has. There was, uh, and then the last one that we'll that we'll cover here is is the at the very very end. This is the the part of the video where he's talking about things that he knows that he can't say, and there's like some voice off camera that says, "Do you know of any main characters dying in the film?" And he responds back with, "The answer to that is." Yes, Star Wars stuff is always super locked down by Disney, but every once in a while, when you're talking to a cast member, they will let something slip out. I know a few things I shouldn't know, and that is all I'm going to say about it because it's so much better to find these things out when you watch the movie. So, again, not really a big shocker that we some a main character is going to die. Um, I threw it out here because I thought, well, let's maybe just talk about it. If you had to put your bets on any one of the main characters dying, who's at the top of your list for Episode Nine? You know, it... From a main character of, of who is you off? I don't know. I, I think it's still, maybe it's because I don't care as much, but like, you know, I, I think like a 3PO or, mm. I mean, maybe even an R2. I mean, we, we love R2, don't get me wrong, but he's been very much a background character now. Yeah. And, and would you, would you go ahead and, and take Lando out? I don't, again, I don't know what purpose that serves unless it's a heroic ending and, and we, we kind of skipped over what happens with Millennium Falcon, but you could argue some of those things might happen, but I think now doesn't, I don't know with Peter Mayhew passing. I know they're very far into this process, but it seems like Chewbacca has to live, right? Yeah. We, we can't lose that too. Right. <laughs> he's, he's kind of the heart and soul of, of star Wars in many cases. And so to lose that heart, I think is something that would be very painful to actually lose, but I'm going to go that it's not a necessarily a main character, but it's going to be a character that we, have known for a very long time and loved. And so my money is still more on one of the droids or both of the droids before anybody else. Yeah. I think in, in my own head canon, it's probably Kylo Ren just because if I think if he is going to have a redemption arc and we've talked about this before, but if he has a redemption arc, I can't see him living on it. it, it I, I'm fine with him re being redeemed, but I think he probably has to go. Um, so he, he makes the top of my list. I would throw Leia in there, but, you know, at the same time, to your point, what purpose does it serve? I don't know. You know right? It, I think it's all circumstantial, but, but yeah, I would say. Do you want a character to live on in honor of the people who bring them to life? And yeah, just to, right, to right. clarify, I was, I was thinking more from the old guard rather than which characters in general, because I tend to agree with you. I mean, it's hard to see where Ben Solo slash Kylo Ren makes it out of this movie alive. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Yeah, I know. And I, I knew we were going, uh, honestly, because we've talked about this together, both on and off the air. Um, so, yeah, I would uh, I think he's probably the likely candidate. And then I don't know. I say Leia, but like the kind of the point you were making here is I, and we've we've said this. I just think the character is probably bigger than her now. And maybe it was even before then. But right. I would like to see her continue to live on. I think there's still a lot of story to tell with Leia. All right, well, let's do let's do the big part here and let's talk about the photos now. So we're going to start with the two cover pieces. So we've got a very menacing looking Kylo Ren in one shot on one cover. And then there is a another cover which has Ray on it. And I don't know, just off the top of my head, I mean, Kylo Ren looks pretty. Pretty similar to the way he looked in episode eight, maybe a little bit thinner. He doesn't look as swollen. Maybe he is. <laughs> maybe. Well, he's just got this slimming quilted uh, outfit on right now. Yeah. Not as many stripes. When you wear stripes, you know, it, it does things to your body. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, Scar looks pretty familiar. It, it's, it looks more in line. It wasn't like the, as, as different as it was going from seven to eight. So this is, a, it still looks very similar to, to how it looked in episode eight. Uh, we, He's got the cloak back, though. That's, that's kind of nice to see the cloak come back. Yeah, cloak's back. No helmet here. Right. The uh, Here's something that's interesting, and I'm going to just jump ahead, but Joanna Robinson, who is a Vanity Fair, went to Twitter today and said, there's actually a pretty clever hidden meaning behind our matching Kylo and Ray covers, and I'll be curious to know if any of you figure it out before Rise of the Skywalker opens. So you're looking hmm. at these covers. Is there anything in here that looks telling or that's a, I guess a secret or clever a hidden message of some sort. No. I mean, if you, if you put them side by side, they look like they're looking at each other. Yeah. And that's, so that's actually one of the, so ding, ding, ding. That's one of the things that people are saying is that they look to be looking at each other. 
the thing that caught my eye was really the, the, the lighting. So you got Kylo Ren standing there. He looks like there's a sunset behind him. And on the opposite shot, you could make an argument that that maybe that, that the sunrise and that it makes me think of the whole darkness fall rises and light to meet it kind of thing. Right. They're uh, interesting though. One of the things that, that was pointed out and I can't take credit for this and I don't know who pointed it out first, but they're both, you can't see their hands. So if you look at Kylo Ren's right hand, it's covered up. If you look at her left hand, it's covered up. And I don't know what significance it is. Uh, someone made a joke that maybe they're both going to lose. We're finally going to get a hand cut off <laughs> in this movie. <laughs> uh, I've heard wedding rings are being hidden and that's why you can't see them. Um, yeah, I don't know if that's true or not. Uh, neither one of them really shows her lightsaber. And I'm looking at, I saw that, and but I'm looking at Ray. And I can see the pistol there, like her blaster. Right. But I don't remember her blaster being that long. So I don't know if that's the muzzle of her blast blaster or if that's supposed to be the her lightsaber that's dangling there. Yeah, I can't I don't yeah, I don't see the lightsaber. And I think you, she usually holds it on her left hip. I'm trying to remember from the teaser now. Yeah, I think it's that is an interesting observation though, that both of their, you know, Kylo's right and her left hand are masked with a breeze blowing their the lower half of their their costumes over that that is an interesting observation yeah there's um the other things that uh, i guess to, worth noting the uh she's holding her staff again so reunited with that right. which is it's kind of neat there was somebody that made a comment about the wind itself in the direction that the wind was blowing in so for for Kylo Ren, that wind is blowing from his left to his right and for ray it's blowing from her right to her left and so Another common theme is there or theory is that they're actually looking at one another and, and somehow this is the same image, uh, you know, they're, it was taken with both of them looking at each other um, and they've just kind of split it apart. But beyond yeah. that, I don't, I don't see anything else here. No, I mean, man, the, I'm just looking at the, on the Daisy Ridley photo, like the color saturate, it almost doesn't look real. <laughs> it's just so saturated, especially her imagery here. Man, that's an impressive photo though. Yeah. Well, and this is, you know, arguably one of the best. So, oh yeah, yeah, she is, and I'm I'm sure they did a little touching up here to even bring out some of these special aspects of it even more. But yeah, but yeah, no, that's interesting. I'm I'm curious to see what it turns out to be if we even remember to go back and <laughs> and look at this, or if there's a scene where this actually comes to light. Yep. Well, I'm setting a reminder right now. Okay. <laughs> yeah, for December 20th or 19th, whenever we get around to recording. Yeah, I'll message her on Twitter and say, what was the answer? Um, yeah, right. Yeah, we still don't know. <laughs> all right. The next one is it's kind of, there's not really a whole lot here. It's Daisy. It's, uh, it looks like a BTS shot. She's standing there. The only thing I wrote, it's called Shooting Stars. Director J.J. Abrams sets up a shot with Daisy Ridley. Uh, there's something about the way the sand interacts with the light, which is kind of cool you know, from a creator uh, perspective, but I saw this and I thought, okay, this must be the day of when they were filming the backflip scene from the teaser trailer. Does she have a hood Yeah, on the back of her outfit yeah, it's, or is that no, a... No, it's a hood. And we see, okay. we actually see it in the teaser trailer at the very end when they're walking up on the Death Star. I think you can see it there as well. I want to see her with the hood. I know, dude. Now. I'm so down. I, think that's I want to see look it. Awesome. It looks very Assassin's Creed. I hate to say that because it 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 does it though. almost kind of blasphemy. But not that that's a bad game. But I wouldn't want to cross the streams like that. But I think it's going to be a very cool look, nonetheless. I just can't wait to see when that hood's on. I, I yeah. imagine not to not to because this is not in the script. But I want a scene very similar to Return of the Jedi when Luke walks in and he's hooded. Right. And we mm -hmm. just see that silhouette. I want something like that, but with Ray and, and maybe not a dark silhouette, but a light silhouette of some dark, some sort. Yeah. We can see someone in the background holding her staff. And again, we don't see her lightsaber on her at all mm. in this picture. Yeah. I think it would be on her right side if she had it. Yeah. Maybe so. Yeah. That seems, that seems right. All right. Well, let's talk about this one. So the next one we have is the Knights of Ren. Says JJ Abrams alongside stunt coordinator, coordinator Eunice Huthart directs the Knights of Rend, elite fearsome enforcers of Kylo Ren's dark will. Yeah, we got about half a dozen of them on the screen here and finally confirmed to you know, be in the movie. And man, they've got an eclectic set of barbaric medieval type of weapons mm. of sorts. Huh? Yeah, they've, uh, so we got one guy, 
the far left guy, I'm calling him gun arm blade or gun arm because it's his his arm looks like it's, <laughs> it's like trap jaw for me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he's he's got his uh, he's got the gun like all up in his arm. So that's interesting. Then we've got machete kills again. That's uh, right there next to him. He's got a big old machete cloud from episode or what is it? Final Fantasy Seven. He almost looks like a Final Fantasy Seven or Final Fantasy Sword kind of character. Then there is uh, the guy in the far right. I'm calling him Batman because I guess he's holding a bat of some sort. Um, it's I don't know some kind of a. That's what I was going to call the guy with the with his back to us because he's look he's got the, like this cowl that goes straight into a cape. Yeah, that that guy looks like Batman. He does look like Batman. And there, and so that so there's that's a good point because there's three of them that we don't see really. Uh, we've got this guy who's got our back their back to us, and they are holding some kind of a golden axe looking thing, right? And then right. the other two, and I'm going to just, I hate to do this, but I am going to touch on spoilers just for one second because they've already released this. I don't understand why they wouldn't release anything else, but we actually know what the other two look like and what weapons they wield. So the other two that you don't see here, and just go on mute for like 30 seconds if you don't want to hear the rest of this. Uh, there's one person that I'm calling Sniper Guy. And if you look in the background there, the, 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 the person that's between J.J. Abrams and the Final Fantasy character, he's got those little blinders on his helmet. That's the sniper guy. So he's got this huge sniper rifle. And then the person to the right of him, which you can barely see, you can only see the, the top of part of his visor. That is the main leader, I'm assuming, because in the other leaked spoiler stuff that I've seen, he that person, and I'm, I'm saying that person because I don't know if it's a female, that person is always standing front and center. And they've got this glaive looking weapon, so which is a, really a long stick with kind of a, a sword at the very end of it, a very shortened sword on it, almost very similar to some of the Praetorian guards and what they were using. So that I think rounds out all six. And I think we've got a confirmation now that there are only six, at least six that are, that will be appearing in this movie uh, for, for the Knights of Ren. And I threw the, the two questions I had out there out there were any of these female based on what I'm seeing here, these all look like males, either that or they're very brutish uh, females um well very very tall yeah, yeah as well because all of these all these people look like they're taller than jj abrams not that that takes much <laughs> yeah right but yeah a lot of uh really mad max inspired costuming here too well, right that's a good yeah that's a good point like and the other so and the other note i have in here is they all wear velcro boots so if you look at their boots <laughs> They're all Velcro straps. But anyways, uh, that's not really important. <laughs> but yeah, like they, the weapons seem very crude at first. But then if you look at like the Final Fantasy sword guy, his sword has some like uh, electronics on the very end. There's a, I don't know what purpose that serves, but if you look at the very Same with the mace yes, as well. Yes. The mace inside the club part actually has something in there. So, uh, so all that to say is they look primitive here. Who knows? Maybe they turn on and they've got some force stuff run around or maybe maybe they've constructed these as uh what was the one we just talked about the uh the crystal in um master and apprentice oh colon yeah crystals. colon crystals i don't know i'm i'm pure pure speculation at this point but i, I so the question people are going to have Albert, yeah. then is are these the guys that kylo is fighting in the teaser trailer well funny you should ask that question so Today, there was in as part of this this release and part of the articles that were released here today from Vanity Fair. At one point, there was a uh, piece and I was, I was going to try to bring it up. Uh, I may not make it in time because I didn't have it prepared. But the article originally stated that Vanity Fair, quote, could confirm that the person that we see Kylo Ren uh, kind of upheave and slam down into the ground with the hilt of his blade in the teaser trailer is in actuality one of the Knights of Ren. If you look at the guy standing with his back to us with the cloak, that would probably be the most likely candidate because it's it, it's kind of tough to see, but in the teaser trailer, the person that he's slamming down has a cloak that looks very similar to this. Within, I don't even know, within minutes, they retracted that. They pulled it off completely, they updated the website, and then they went on, they went so far uh, as to go on to Reddit, I think, of all places, and said, hey, sorry, that was a mistake. We've confirmed uh, that we should not have said that. It was you know, taken out of context, and that's really not what happened. So they walked it back pretty quickly. In my head, I can't help but think that was just a slip up, that they, I don't think they meant to do that or meant to state that. And I think that uh, to go back to answering your question, I think it is. I think there is a moment in here where Kylo Ren is fighting the, the Knights of Ren, and that was a scene that we got. It's, I think we speculated 
And um, this kind of confirmed it for me. It's still going to be really interesting to see how they work these guys into the story of, of how they fit and how does the master of the Knights of Ren fit with them. And then, yeah, how, does, how do they decide to, if they do come into conflict with one another, what's, what's that callus for that change? Mm-hmm. There, uh, let's talk about the next one here. This is a really great one. It's called First Look. Yeah. Vanity Fair reveals Carrie Russell as the masked scoundrel, Zori Bliss, seen in the thieves' quarter of a snow-dusted world, Kijimi. Kijimi? I think that's how you say that. Kijimi. Yeah, Kijimi. Close enough. So, qu- question. Awesome. In a word, just awesome yeah, look. it's a great look. Um, it's, got a, it's got a Sam Wessel kind of vibe going on there. I said, I posted a picture. It reminds me of The Rocketeer, if you've ever seen that movie. Mm-hmm. In the yeah. 80s. I don't know why. The um, What I like about it, though, is the intricacies of the belt and like just of the her tunic as well as whatever is strapped around her her kind of abdomen and her, her armbands. I mean, there's this detail. detail. Yeah. yeah, there's this detail to all of it that has carvings that you keep thinking has some sort of lore to it. But the question I have is, what is she holding? Well, and that's <laughs> she's got she's got a dual wielding something that's just out of camera angle here for us yeah it looks to me and i I, my notes on this were that she's dual wielding blasters and and the way they're the way they're sitting is not traditionally how you would holster a blaster right if you holstered them like this you would have to cross your arms to pull them out if that makes sense right? right you wouldn't just go you wouldn't go to your hip and pull straight up you would actually cross your arms to pull them out and fire but it looks they look to me like uh, very similar to like we saw with uh, uh, Django Fett, right? He was using, he was kind of dual wielding blasters. Um, I, I, they look like gold blasters of some sort. Mm, I could be wrong, but it looks like there's a scope on the one that's in the forefront uh, foreground there. You can see the little not the scope with the little sight at the very tip right. of, the, of the muzzle there. But um, they nailed this costume design though. Yeah, and she made a comment too that she had the coolest costume in, in episode nine and i think she's right i might be inclined to agree after seeing it like this <laughs> i mean and her helmet yeah I mean, it's it's got and even her her breastplate that goes and extends to her back has it's got a lot of nice wear on it kind of like what we saw with boba fett armor in, in the original trilogy just this nice wear she's got some rust lines on the helmet you know it's very well worn but man they they nailed this design she looks fantastic in it yeah the helmet looks cool I, it's it almost looks there's almost kind of an emphasis nest vibe too going on with it yeah uh, to some extent but so here's a and the visor seems practical <laughs> right yeah there's <laughs> no weird huge, slots or anything like that yeah yeah huge display presumably lots of whiz bang stuff going inside of it it's probably really wizard annie yeah. <laughs> well that's better than my joke i was gonna say this is why old people go with solar shades because it's just more practical the um the other thing that with her is they they mentioned that she's a scoundrel but she looks like a bounty hunter to me with, yeah, and I thought that's what they teased it as originally, didn't yeah, they? Yeah, that's what I thought too. Yeah, I don't know. It, I mean, it could all be, depending on your perspective and point of view, it's probably one and the same, right? Scoundrel, smuggler, bounty hunter, whatever. It depends. But but yeah. Well, I might like scoundrels now too, then. Yeah, me too. The uh, the snow-dusted world of Kijim is the new world. Um, I don't know. I don't really have any thoughts as to why she's here or how she fits into the storyline. Uh, there's a loose theory I have that maybe she's the one that we see flying the ship that we think may be the same ship that was in episode seven that dropped off Ray. So maybe there's a connection with Ray. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, if you want to go down the, the rabbit hole of who's Ray's mom, mm-hmm. yeah, maybe that'd be a pretty cool one actually. Yeah. yeah and the other, uh, the other question I have is why the mask, right? We, we, we asked that a lot. Sometimes there's a lot of different reasons. And I think we've, we've talked about it in one episode before about why, characters wear masks uh i think it was on the infest nest one but maybe there's some significance to the mask but interesting that she has it on so Very well, cool. yeah let's talk about uh this one force major this is like uh i don't know what to think about this picture but this is a picture of hux and the new character this is allegiant general pride played by richard e grant uh we've got a picture of them sitting on the bridge of kylo ren's destroyer and man they look like they are having the time of their lives i mean just look at them they are. They're making pottery. <laughs> I mean, and um, we're making a joke. I mean, they're in character. I get it. But they just don't look happy. Like, life sucks. Hux finally looks grown up. He does. You know? Yeah. He's got the line, the battle lines kind of on his face. I mean, he, 
and maybe it's the maybe it's the style of the picture or the you know kind of the lighting but you know he looks older i think and that's i think that's going to be important for his character if he comes across as a more serious character finally and of course richard e grant i didn't even recognize him at first because yeah i mean he is all business and the the title suggests that uh, that's probably appropriate force major force major yeah yeah for, yeah, because force majeure means something else in, in where I work. I mean, yeah, there was a, some odd speculation that, you know, this was Huck's father, which, of mm. course, if, if you've, yeah, if you've read any of the books <laughs> and you know that his father died a pretty terrible, painful, death. gross death. Thanks, thanks uh, to Hux. At, yeah, thanks to Sonny Boy over here. Jerk. Um, I, I mean, I do appreciate the First Order's minimalist design. <laughs> there's not a lot of clutter uh, that that always strikes a chord with me uh but no all seriousness it's uh it's um it's a pretty interesting shot they i don't know what else to say really there's really not a whole lot a lot here i think he's holding like a stick or one of those nazi type of whips or whatever they were you can't really oh well, yeah i, I didn't think even he's holding that. something yeah, right. left him huh this looks like a portrait it does it looks like the family photo it does. <laughs> Not the fan that flame yeah, at all. Right. But. All right. Well, let's go to the next picture here. Uh, this is another behind the scenes footage shot. We've got Chewbacca, 3PO, and Poe, and Ray. Sorry. Um, and Finn. And is Finn in here? Yep. Front oh, yeah. Man. No, sorry. I said Poe. I meant Finn. Yep. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Chewie's got his bowcaster. Finally. Finally got it. Poe's got a gun. Ray's got her staff. And 3PO has an umbrella. Go yeah, figure. Finn's got a gun too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, Finn's got a gun too. Uh, next shot is the, the hot, it's called Hot Take. Members of the crew shade and shine Daniels, the only cast member to appear in all nine Skywalker films while BB-8 looks on and definitely looks like a golden rod. I like that he's all uniform gold. It's always been the best look for him. I don't like when he's, I like when they mix and match parts and, and all that. And there's reasons why that happens from time to time, but it's cool to see him in the final movie, just in complete gold, golden rod. Does it seem like we always get this picture with him, yeah. though? Yeah, it's the same pose. Awkward, uncomfortable. Sweating in the sun. Sweating in the sun. Planet. <laughs> well, it's funny. It's it's like they're dabbing sweat off his brow, you know, or off off his cheeks. Um, yeah, make makeup check. Right, yeah. All right, uh, BB-8 looks cute as always. Next one, I don't know what's going on here. It's really cool. There's that. They're working. Yeah, that college student graduate named J.J. Abrams holding his cafe latte right there with his sun shades on and filming. Uh, all right, let's get to the more important one. This is called Horsing Around. Finn and new ally Jana, played by Naomi Aki, excuse me, atop uh, Hardy Orbox, lead the charge against the mechanized forces of the First Order. It's extremely surreal to be in it, says Aki. Is it Aki? I hope I'm saying that right. And see how it works from the inside. Yeah. So this is a really great shot. Like, this is probably my second favorite shot. Uh, well, I don't know. They're all, there are a lot of these are really good, but this is pretty high up there for me. Um, yeah, I like the Orbach design. What do you mean? What do you think about the uh, mechanized forces, though? See, I heard is that uh, is that a literal term or is that just figure? I just thought you know ATMTs or the uh, MT sixes or whatever they were, the Walkers, and you think about that stuff. That's what I. That's what I think. When I think mechanized, that's what I think. I don't. I don't think that bow and arrow is going to work too well. True. <laughs> I mean, unless it's an explosive shot or you know, it's got what do they call them? The Gungans. What do they use? Oh, the boop. Bomb the pads? Boopas? Boombas? Bumbas? I uh, forget what it is. I can't remember. Or it's got like a miniaturized ion cannon. At the very Sorry, tip. That's, yeah, that's my, uh, that's my fanfic. Those Orbox look kind of cool. They're like, they're like a cross between a horse, an Afghan hound, if you're into dogs, and then, but with tusks. Yeah. Which is. These are great. I mean, they've got like war paint on them too. I think that's a really cool design and they're dressed i mean these are like these are dressed like war horses effectively and i, th I think it's a really neat design i really like this i think this looks good yeah a uh, jana looks cool i mean she's using it like you said a bow and arrow and she's riding side saddle which is always interesting that people do that or that you do that i mean you only do that if you're trying to pull off a shot um the native americans did that quite a bit but the imagery itself is really cool i don't remember there was a scene in or that no there wasn't a scene but in the art of solo there was a moment where Chewbacca, um, Solo, and Dryden, I think. Is it Dryden? No. Not Dryden. Um, what's his face? 
the main dude. They're uh, back it. Thank you. I think all three of them were writing something, and I didn't get a chance to go back and look and see if it was the same thing or not. I, it may not be, but uh, that was the first thing I thought. I was like, oh, I wonder if these are the ones that they just repurposed from that movie. But anyways, it's a co- really great shot. Um, I can't wait to see how this plays out, especially she's got this whole kind of Native American thing going on here, which is always really interesting for me. Yep. Uh, all right, here we go. This is uh, the money shot. Yeah, the money yeah. shot. Starcross, Kylo Ren, Adam Driver, and Ray battle out with lightsabers in a stormy confrontation. Their force connection, which Driver calls maybe bound, will turn out to be to run out deeper, deeper than previously revealed. And this is the one that got everybody a buzz because there's a lot of speculation about what the heck's going on here. So I'll let you. You want to take it first? What are your thoughts on this? Right. I haven't read the speculation, but what they're battling on top of this seems suggestive that. This is whatever was left of maybe maybe what is left of the Death Star mm-hmm. because we know that the the establishing shot of what was left of the Death Star when uh, Ray and company walk up to on the edge of the cliff kind of looked like maybe we were getting some storm clouds if I remember that yeah. right and yeah. a very churning water so we could you know, it's not easy to or it's not hard to take that leap that now we've got a confrontation on the remnants of the of the old space station or or something else that might be cratered in this lake or this. Uh, body of water yeah there's and that's that's kind of where I, so my thoughts looking at this picture one i don't think they're fighting each other i know the the description on the article or the description of the picture says that they're they're in a confrontation but it doesn't necessarily say they're in a confrontation with one another so if you look at the image he's not looking at her and she's not looking at him they're he, he's kind of looking past her and she's looking off to his left so I don't, I don't one believe that they're fighting. Some people have said maybe they photoshopped this. I don't think they photoshopped this. These are all Lan Andy Leibowitz's pictures, and I would really be hard pressed to think that she would be okay with them doctoring her art and and messing with any of this stuff. I really believe that all of these are what she captured, and I'll take that at face value. So if you even with the light, if, I mean, clearly they had to do something. They got the lightsaber true, lit up. That's right? true. Uh, that's fair. I but, but with this shot here though, I don't I. To me, it feels like they're fighting something else. And I don't know what that is. You could argue it's Palpatine's ghost or a spirit or who knows what it is. Um, but I don't think they're fighting each other. I, and it does. I'm with you. I, it To me, uh, if you look at the, the bottom there, they're fighting on some kind of metal surface. I think this is probably, you know, part of the the Death Star. Uh, I've seen people out there saying maybe they're fighting on the Millennium Falcon. Maybe. But if you look at, there's one shot in that one video that we didn't really talk about. There's a picture of uh, Daisy Ridley uh, without any of the special effects and blue screen behind her. And the only thing that's real or substantial is the actual ground and the ground itself is, you can tell it is this piece here. So it looks gray in, in, in that particular lighting. So it looks like it could very well be one of the other, whether it be the Millennium Falcon or the Death Star. And I'm leaning with you towards Death Star stuff. Yeah, I mean, you can see why they would make that speculation, though. It, it kind of looks, I mean, there are parts of the Falcon that definitely have these raised sections, especially around the sides. So you can see where they might come across with that. But it, I don't know. It, it's hard. Yeah, there's not much else to it. So it's difficult to say, but I'm probably still going to lean towards on location, not Falcon crashed into the water. Yeah fighting on top of the Falcon. Yeah. Um, other questions that have worse Kylo's helmet. Um, we just didn't see it at all in any of these pictures, which makes sense. I guess if you're really trying to capture yeah, not driver, surprising but, there. Uh, and then my first thought when I saw this was the, just the lighting in the rain. I thought, okay, well maybe they're good. They, maybe this is a scene that ties back to the force vision in the force awakens. And, but mm, no, probably not, not dark enough. Yeah. I mean, it's man, it's kind of Ray's footing i can see where people might think this is a photoshop raised footing looks a little hmm, placed if you will and yeah i would i I would say if there's any real life real life can blur that too but it it, i can see where people might be going off on that tangent and seeing that there's something there but yeah she's clearly blocking something and you don't you don't pose like that unless uh, (laughs) unless something is actively happening to you and and she could be blocking something from behind so I would say that if there's any pictures that have been photoshopped, it's probably this one, and they may have done it for for those reasons and not spoil anything. But then it's like, what? You, why would you? Well, you couldn't find another picture to show. Yeah, exactly. And we had talked about this with the novel last week. I don't. 
like being presented something that is categorically false, yeah. <laughs> even for excitement purposes. And I get trailers do this pretty often, but there's some amount of liberty I'm willing to give on some of this, but yeah, it's interesting. This is a great shot. It looks great. I mean, it, it really does get you excited for whatever's happening, but yeah, the more you think about it, you're like, okay, what, there's something quite not right yeah. <laughs> with what we're seeing right here of, of how this fits into the actual film itself. The, um, we got two more behind the scenes shots. We won't get into those just in the interest of time. We've got the cockpit. So this one's called punch it in a historic reunion reunion. Lando Calrissian retakes the helm of the Millennium Falcon, joined by Poe Dameron, Chewbacca, Dio, and BB-8. And my notes say they forgot to mention L3. <laughs> That's right. She's right there. Oh, yeah, in the you background. can see her right there. Um, yeah, clear as, clear day. as day. But the uh, man, droid rights have not come any further. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, the absence of the dice is kind of weird, right? And that's a great point. That. Yeah, I mean, it's. This, this opening of the cockpit seems wider than what we've seen in other pho uh, photography sessions too, yeah. right? This one seems like it's got a lot more ceiling to it than what we, and maybe it's just the framing of the shot. I mean, I like that we, we've got this continuity with the Falcon and, and this cockpit shot, but yeah, you're right. The, the dice are missing, but maybe Luke actually did take mm -hmm. them. Maybe he did. He didn't put them back. Sure. Uh, let's see my other notes pose costume is a cosplayer's dream um <laughs> is that coaxium right there on the arm on the console right next to uh lando yeah the big blue canister yeah, uh -huh. looking thing i don't know that's interesting they just pop it right in the console now <laughs> yeah no more going to the back hit, just need a little pick me up that's boom, right. right there hit turbo boost right there and you're good to go yeah uh, it's a cool shot. I like uh, I like the the composition on this one and and the placing of everybody. It's really neat. Yeah, the saturation looks great, especially with the falcon in the background. It, it, man, I would these. I'm a big fan of these shots, though. In general, I think these are really great. Yeah. So this is the next shot is called Well Met, and this is where we get to see the Aki Aki, which are the natives of this new planet called Pasana. That planet's never been out there before. It's all totally new. Uh, this was, I think, my, maybe my favorite one. Honestly, just. Everything about it, I, I really like. Um, and there's really not a whole lot here, and it's probably just a, these characters will be in the movie all of about 20 seconds, probably, right? But um, but yeah, again, just the color, the lighting, the way it's framed, I just love it. Clouds in the background, looks amazing. Uh, we get the picture of John Williams next. We talked about that one. And then finally, let's end on this one here. This is called From the Ashes. Mark Hamill as Luke with RTD2. Speculation is rampant about who will rise as the Skywalker from the movie's title and how that choice will reflect the way the world has changed since Star Wars debuted in 1977. Now, this is the one that Mike and I were going back and forth with because I think in his mind, and he's not here to defend himself, so I'm just going to pick on him, but he mentioned that he feels like this is a some kind of a, maybe a possible confirmation that Luke is back and back more than just a Force ghost. I just have a really hard time believing that that's the case. I think... This is going to go back to uh, what I said earlier, where I'm, I'm going to give any the benefit of the doubt and assume that not, this has not been touched or photoshopped in, in some way. But I just don't believe that this is th this being her medium uh, and that she does old school photography. It's all about lighting, composition, color, perspective, that kind of thing that I think they weren't going to go put a force ghost like uh image around him right or then we're going to put a like the what is it the lumen the what am i trying to say here the glow right i don't think they would go back and do that on here and i think this is more than anything i think really all this shot is doing is saying look luke is in this movie you can expect him back and uh and that's and that that's probably it that's all we're going to tell you but we're not going to go out and show you him in, in force ghost form kind of thing but i don't know what are your thoughts on it this really looks like Last Jedi photography, well, of his get up, his look, and why would R if he was a Force Ghost, why would R two be right next to him? Yeah, that seems less likely. Unless R two is now a Force Ghost too, <laughs> whatever. And, and again, the flames behind it. This is very reminiscent of Last Jedi, and so why would he be? What's the scenario where he's in this environment again? And the color saturation, the lighting, like you said. This seems like a composed and a composited type of shot, but if we're willing to give her the benefit of the doubt, then I really am not entirely sure, but I'm definitely with you. They would not go, 
she wouldn't doctor the photo to go back and make him look like a forced ghost. They would just rather say, this is just the, this is just the photography. This is just is what it is. But again, why would R2 be right there with him if he was already gone? Yeah. And I think it's the other, the other stuff that uh, you probably could speculate on. Maybe this is just a force, like a force back or a flashback scene in the movie. Um, could be a possibility. Uh, beyond that, I mean, again, the, then you get into the, the supernatural. Is he, is he really back? Has he, has, has his powers manifested to the point where when he reappears, he looks solid, much like the dice, right? Looks and feels and everything like it's real, but he's really not there. I mean, you can make that argument too, but in my head, what would you think about that though? If, if, if I don't, I don't think that's going to happen, but if that were to happen, how would that make you feel about force ghosts and our, our history of knowing it a certain way for so long and then for it to change really fundamentally. Yeah, I don't know. It almost, I, I don't want to use the word cheapens it, but it takes something away from it, I think. Yeah. It's kind of, it shorts the other folks like poor qui you know, he <laughs> barely gets his voice out there and here's Luke coming he back. his moment in the cartoons. <laughs> right. Um, so you were saying. Oh, no, I just, it was, a, it was a silly little headcanon thing that, if if that really is Luke coming back as a force ghost, I like the idea that R2 just immediately goes back to his side. And then the minute he dissipates, he just goes back about and does whatever he does. Just a, you know, a good little R2 George would do. So R2 seems a little on the small side too, just for scale. He doesn't even come up to his waist. Mm. I don't remember him being Luke being that tall. This is now my wallpaper for, um, uh, my is it, la- I mean, my it's laptop. a great looking yeah. shot. Make no mistake. This is a fantastic composition. This is really cool. Yeah. All right. Well, I think we've, uh, we probably extended our stay here. We're coming up on an hour and a half, but before we go, um, we just want to touch real quickly on one shout out that we have this week. Uh, I want to say thank you to Wookie nuts over at star Wars Photoshop for indulging my request. They, he, uh, if you guys don't know, uh, so Star Wars Photoshop goes out and they basically Photoshop pictures of Star Wars characters and mix and match them with other pop culture stuff, that kind of thing. And so cool. What's that? It's so yeah, cool. Yeah, there's a lot of yeah. great stuff out there. Now he's, he's gotten into videos as well that he does. He's got a huge following. So please go follow and support the page. But he had reached out and, uh, recently earlier this week and was like, hey, guys, if you have any ideas, I'd love to hear from you. You know, PM me, send me a message and let me know what you had. So last week we were watching Thor Ragnarok uh, with the kids. And one of my sons said when Thor was coming down, he goes, whoa. And just for a split second, he goes, whoa, I thought that was the emperor coming down. And this is that infamous shot on the bridge where Thor's coming in and, and attacking all those soldiers or whatever they are. And um, and I was like, oh, yeah. And so we just kind of played it out right there in the moment. I said, that would be really cool if that was the if that was the emperor and not thor and i said but what if those guys all those soldiers were actually like clone troopers or maybe rebels and he's like oh yeah that'd be really cool and he's like hey dad can you do that and i'm like no there's no way i could possibly doctor a photo like that and just out of nowhere this this request comes up and i thought well let me just ping him so i sent him this message and i'm like this is probably way out there and and probably beyond the, the possibility of of reality but maybe you know i kind of threw the threw the idea out there and then Two days later, he turns around and he produces this picture. And I was just so excited and so thrilled. Um, and I went ahead and wrote a little, uh, what do you call it, uh, intro fan fiction type thing for it as well, which right. in the interest of time, I, I probably won't read tonight. But uh, it's out there on social media if you want to read it. But it, it, to sum it up. I think there's a part here that's kind of sums it up pretty well. As Vader embarks on his mission to extinguish the last remaining Jedi, Palpatine is made aware of a small band of clone troopers known as the Enlightened. Soldiers who remove their inhibitor chips prior to Order 66 and slave, and are slaves no more. And then and then you get the picture of Palpatine coming with the force of lightning and, and them starting to raise up at him. I think that sets the stage perfectly. I'm not going to let you off the hook without <laughs> reading some of your fan fiction on air. Come on, yeah. brother. Yeah, it's- but I think that sets it perfectly of what this image is doing. So please go check the social media site and and follow Star Wars Photoshop. He's always doing something so fun, so thought provoking at times, and also just just so amusing at other times. And just it's every day is a new adventure, so it's a lot of fun. So go check that yeah. out. Yeah, thank you, Mister Nuts, for indulging me and for doing <laughs> that. That's so awesome. And looking forward to thank you for saying that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you for uh, I can't wait. Uh, 
like, this is one of those sites that, you know, honestly, when you go to like, uh, look at all the stuff that we follow, these are, this guy is one of the ones that I look forward to every day to see what's new, that kind of thing. So, all right, well, that's going to do it for this week's show next week. We promise next week, unless we get some crazy news or uh, bomb. <laughs> we promise unless we change unless our we mind. Unless we change our mind. <laughs> we are going to come back and do kind of a follow-up story, follow-up show to Master and Apprentice. We'll, we'll get into uh, visions and prophecies within Star Wars and then really kind of break down the prophecies that are that you'll find in Master and Apprentice and kind of do what we did tonight and just speculate on what we were, what they may have been referring to or talking about or what is yet to come with those prophecies going forward. So yeah, I'm kind of excited about that one. It's a kind of what the Cantina cast is known for some of those types of things. So I'm really excited to get back into that. Cool. All right. Any last words before we head out? Nope. Let's turn the page. Turn the page. All right. We'll see you guys next week. You're still listening. Wow. That's amazing. Well, I'm here to give you the disclaimer. Normally we do a big, long, drawn-out disclaimer thing saying what's what and who's what and all that other stuff, but I think you guys kind of know that Lucasfilm and Disney have uh, no affiliation with us at all, uh, and we have none with them. Uh, We talk about Star Wars, which is their property and all that other good, fun stuff, uh, but I think you can tell which is our stuff and which is their stuff. If you can't, well, then send a lawyer to send an email to me, and I'll be glad to chat with them. Other than that, you know what's what, so that's your disclaimer. 